I'm a scientist. I'm not a political activist. But the war on science is raging, and the gloves are off. I'm going to talk about science, lies, and politics today. The story is how science for the public good wins out eventually, but after the, a long battle, and that battle has to be fought. We're actually used to being lied to, starting in the 40s and 50s with tobacco and their amazing advertising campaign. Doctors were actually paid to tell the public that smoking was good for you, and they were selling their brands. Movie stars glamorized smoking, and who doesn't know the ending to this? Winston tastes good, like. Thank you. So also, the Macho Men, the Marlboro Men, were smoking, and about half the population was uh, smoked at one time, around the 60s. Uh, then people started getting lung cancer, Inconveniently for the industry, tobacco went on the attack. This is the playbook, because cancer was a threat to profits. It was known for a long time that uh, cigarettes contained carcinogens, the hydrocarbons. The industry pulled out this playbook of deception. They denied the connection between cancer for decades. They attacked the science. They spent millions on lawsuits against cancer victims. And some of us know some of those people. Eventually, <clears throat> the labels were put on cigarette packs to warn the public of the dangers. But this was after a very long battle with many casualties. One by one, many of the Marlboro men, most of them died of lung cancer, along with millions of others. It was about power, about lying, and you have to follow the money. Petrochemicals came in right after World War II and were heavily marketed. DDT was a miracle of modern science. Uh, the cell was, DDT was going to rid us of all the insects and pests. But Rachel Carson <coughs> pointed out that DDT was killing thousands of birds because we were poisoning the environment. Birds were literally dropping from the sky. She went public on uh, CBS, and uh, her book, Silent Spring, is just a t tremendous classic in environmental health. Uh, it started the environmental health movement, made, uh, passed legislation that was meaningful, and it was the beginning of the EPA. But the chemical industry attacked her viciously. The industry chemists on uh, TV actually said that if we followed Carson's advice, these insects and vermin would destroy the planet. And as you can see, this is one of those insects that got away. <laughs> uh, my first encounter with the politics of deception was in photography. It started in a dark room, literally a dark room filled with chemicals. It was the 70s, nobody knew about the dangers, we had no ventilation, no precautions, no skin protection, nothing. Later, <clears throat> I was contacted by the landscape photographer Ansel Adams, uh, you know, who was a major environmentalist. By then, I had a background in both film and toxicology, and he asked me to write a book about the dangers of photochemicals. And I said, really? And he said, yes, because photographers were getting sick and dying some of them of cancer. Most of the chemicals in photography were held by the companies as trade secrets. And um, I went digging. I was able by, uh, it's another story, but able to access these secret formulas from, an, uh, I'd say, an unwitting toxicologist at Kodak. The health effects turned out were horrible, serious. Not just skin irritation, but cancer birth defects, brain damage, sterility. The book came out in 83, and guess what? Kodak went on the attack. The thing was that photographers caught on very quickly. They got the message. They started demanding ventilation. 
demanding uh, skin protection, respirators, OSHA got involved, and ultimately the science, I must say, transformed the field. BP oil spill. In 2010, BP followed the deception playbook perfectly. Um, it was May. Uh, they were, the oil was gushing. They were spraying and injecting colossal amounts of dispersant into the gulf to hide the oil, and there was concern about toxicity. And BP was going around telling the cleanup workers, do not wear your respirator, you don't need it, and it will scare away the tourists. <clears throat> the company, Nalco, was saying, as I think some of you remember this, that uh, Corexit was as safe as Dawn dishwashing soap. An oil worker working for Exxon is required to wear when handling Corexit. During the dive, I was able to see exactly what was going on. This person's breaking up the oil into tiny pieces. It's releasing powerful solvents that penetrate the skin very easily, take the oil into a, a cell, a body, a person. You can see here, this is after 30 minutes in the water, the Corexit is under the skin. It's easy to see that under fluorescence. All of this predicted a public health crisis. The Department of Interior formed a science working group. I was on that. We issued a report that said the combination of oil and Corexit is going to cause serious health effects, cancer. There's no safe level of exposure. But guess what? The report never saw the light of day. It was suppressed. Now why? Here's a clue. BP mounted this <clears throat> amazing phony PR campaign declaring that the Gulf was safe. Uh, people that were victims that were very sick were told uh, basically to keep quiet. Even the doctors told them, hey, this is just all in your head. There's no connection. BP was making profits at the time in the range of 100 billions a quarter, and the connection had to be denied. But science wins out just in September. The, our federal government, the National Institutes of Health, came out with a study that said, confirmed exactly what we all knew, that Corexit was not safe after all. Public health victory. Flame retardants are another story. In the 70s, flame retardants like Tris were added to kids' pajamas. I don't know if you remember this. Okay? The industry said that we had to prevent uh, horrible fire deaths and that chemicals were the only way to do this. And then uh, chemicals were shown to be mutagenic. They caused cancer. And they were banned from children's clothing. So now what happens next? The industry decides, well, we can market them differently. Let's put them in furniture, plastics, baby products, car seats, baby pillows, toys. Now our homes are full of these chemicals, and so are our bodies. Fast forward 30 years. Science proved two things. One, the chemicals don't work. They're not effective. They do not prevent fires. They do not stop fires. Two, they're incredibly toxic to kids' brains. They cause cancer, birth defects, and many other uh, terrible health consequences. When flame retarded furniture catches on fire, the chemicals get much more toxic, and they form carcinogens in fire smoke. And today, tragically, our firefighters are dying young of multiple kinds of cancer. This is something I've been working on. Not to mention that these things are all over the environment. They're everywhere. They're in Antarctic penguins. They're in Arctic whales. They're in seals, dolphins, birds, all over the world. But science <clears throat> went, went out again very recently, a, a week or two ago. The CPSC, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, came out with to warn the public about the danger of these chemicals in furniture and baby products. It took a long time, but this to me is a huge public health victory. Yay. It's going to protect millions of us from exposure 
to these chemicals. Um, our problem isn't the science or the likes of me, it is the politics. I just don't have words for this. <laughs> the war on science is raging. Our health and environmental protections are being stripped. Respectable scientists are being fired. Strangely, important information is disappeared from the government websites. But the biggest lie of all is climate change denial. It's full speed ahead with fossil fuel frenzy, public health, and the environment, the planet be damned. Ultimately, ironically, this crisis may be what brings all of us together to save our world, and I'll explain this. The climate crisis is tremendous, and evidence is everywhere. It's right before our very eyes. Is there anyone who doesn't see this? Hurricanes, flooding of coastal cities, wildfires, climate refugees in the millions, and the economic costs are in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And that does not <clears throat> speak to the devastation of human lives. Think of Puerto Rico. This is bad enough, right? <clears throat> and I am just the harbinger of bad news for you today. But whoa, here's a kicker for you. Plastics. Well, as you know, plastics come from petroleum. They're a byproduct of fossil fuels, right? Right. Breaking news. <clears throat> the chemical industry has decided to invest $164 billion in building new plastics plants. This, this would increase plastic production 36% in eight years. This is being driven by cheap oil from fracking, and this, could, this boom in plastics could go on, will go on for decades if it happened. To me, this is unthinkable. It's, this is ecocide. Plastics crisis is out of control. Many of us work on that. The oceans are choking with plastics. Microplastics are getting into the food chain, into our bodies. Here's some good news. We are pushing back. We are adapting. The um, renewable energy economy is uh, outpacing the fossil fuel economy, actually. This is happening across all sectors, you know, uh, tra transportation, fuel, etc. And uh, it's very exciting what's happening. This is the, in my opinion, the uh, progressive green transformation we've all been waiting for. And it, it is happening. It's driven by the market. Turns out that clean energy, non-toxic products are good business. So the message is, the future we want is almost here. Last story, 400 years ago, Galileo was branded a heretic for proving that the Earth revolves around the sun. This, his science was threatening to the religious dogma of the day, and the church put a gag order on Galileo and held him under house arrest for the next 30 years of his life. But, as we all know, his ideas prevailed and did change the world. The problem is today, we don't have that kind of lag time. We're up against a real planetary deadline. We need our planet back. And the truth is, it's a possibility. All of us here are activated, we're motivated. We're forming coalitions. What's happening is absolutely exciting. And the future we want is within our grasp. Thank you.